Man, they did a phenomenal job today leading us in worship as they always do. Man, I'm so thankful to be a part of a church that can just come in and just, man, just instantly just be in the presence of God. Like, man, like that. It's amazing, isn't it? Well, before I get to my message this morning, as you heard in the announcement, man, this Saturday we are launching with our brand new extension campus meeting Saturday at 5 o'clock. Man, I'm so pumped. I really do believe that we are on the cusp of something amazing. You know, as I think about this Saturday and what it means and what it represents, I can't help but think of 40 years ago when my parents and several other families decided to take a step of faith. They started meeting as a Bible study. They started to just really get into the Word. They wanted to come together and just really discover who Jesus is. They wanted to worship Jesus. They wanted to see Him move. And right now, you are sitting and experiencing the fruit from those seeds being planted 40 years ago. And so I really believe that this is our time. This is our act of obedience and us taking a step of faith so that in 40 years, it's going to be our kids, it's going to be our grandkids that are going to be saying, man, I cannot believe that when Pastor Shanick and the team got together, they decided to go out and start planning other campuses and seeing other people just come to life in Christ and instilling in them just this grace and sonship. And man, isn't this amazing what we're experiencing because of their act of obedience 40 years Ago. Man, I really believe that is going to be amazing. It is going to be awesome. But I do want to say this, that yes, this Saturday night is going to be another option for you, and people love options, right? That's why right next to a McDonald's, there's a Burger King and a Taco Bell and a Dairy Queen, right? People love options. And so, yes, this is going to be another option for you. I've met so many people that have come up and said, man, I'm so excited about this because I work Sunday mornings and I'm not able to be there. So this allows me to be with my church family on Saturday night. And if that's you, we're going to welcome you in. We're going to just extend just a big hug and we're going to be so thankful that you're there. But if you're here and you're kind of part of this core at this church, not, I don't want to say that we won't welcome you, but when we see you walk in through those doors, don't be surprised if myself or a member of our team grabs you and maybe puts you to work, right? Because we're going to invest into this community. This is a worship. This is a service for the people of Portland, and we're going to go down there, and we're just going to show them Jesus by the way we love them. And so we might grab you and just simply say, hey, I want you to go sit with this person, get to know them, talk to them, take them out afterward. We might grab you and say, hey, we were expecting 40 kids tonight, but we got 80 back there. We really need some help just pouring Jesus into this next generation. You know, we might grab you and say, man, there's a lot of people coming in that are not being greeted, that are not, be, uh, that are not getting a hug or a handshake. Man, hey, go, go prop up by the door and just say hi to somebody. So does that make sense? If you come out Saturday night, we're going to love to see you, but also know we might put you to work. Is that all right? All right, well, let me get to my assignment today, get to my message, and uh, I'm good. I don't need that today. Corey's trying to look out for me. I appreciate that, but uh, I'm just going to roll today. I really feel like God's laid something on my heart that I just want to just release, and I don't want to be tied to my podium, tied to my notes. I want you to have a connection with my heart as God just really laid something uh, on my heart to share with you this morning. So I want to start off this morning with just a simple question. I want you to think about this. What comes to your mind when you think about God? What comes to your mind when you think about God? You know, the the famous theologian A.W. Tozer, he said, what you think about when you think about God, what comes to your mind is the most important thing about your life. You see, because what comes to your mind when you think about God determines how you relate to God. And then how you relate to God determines how close you are to Him. What comes to your mind when you think about God ultimately determines how you see yourself, how you see others, and ultimately how you live your life. It's an incredible question to wrestle with. What comes to your mind when you think about God? For a lot of you, you might picture like this muscular warrior with a thunderbolt in his hand, ready to strike you down if you break one of his commands. Right, like this cop in the sky, just sitting there waiting for you to mess up so that he can issue you a ticket. 
But if that's your view of God, chances are you're going to live your life in what? Fear. And how close can you get to someone that you're afraid of? Maybe for you, you view God like this sleepy grandpa in the sky. That yes, he created everything. Yes, he initiated life. But then he took a hands-off approach and he's not involved anymore. Like he's this cosmic force out in the distance somewhere. But if that is your view of God, how close can you get to someone? What kind of relationship can you develop with a God you believe is not there? What do you think about? What comes to your mind when you picture God? You know, maybe for a lot of you, you, you have good things that come to mind. Like when you think about God, you picture someone who is holy, who is magnificent, who is gracious, who is creator, who is sustainer. Some of you have all these incredible things that come to mind when you picture God. But I'm here to tell you this morning, there is one thing that God wants you to picture. There is one way he wants you to go to him and to address him. And to really illustrate how he wants to be addressed, i got to talk to you just for a minute about how people address me specifically. So here's the deal. When, uh, when my parents, they named me, they named me Shannick Scott Bannon. That's what's on my birth certificate. But here's the deal. If you actually or if someone calls my house and I answer, it's in the evening or whatever, and I pick up the phone and say hello, and if someone says, is Chanuk there or Chinook there, I know without a shadow of a doubt this person does not know me. Like it's a telemarketer, and I just want to instantly hang up, right? They do not know who I am. There are some people, though, maybe it's because they don't want to butcher my name, they actually address me as Mr. Bannon. Right now, with Mr. Bannett, right, it's this formal term. People say it to show a little bit of respect. And, uh, you know, it might be somebody who calls. Maybe it's like a doctor's office. Is Mr. Bannett there? Yes. All right, we have the test results from your recent MRI or whatever, right? There is some the formalness that comes with being addressed as Mr. Bannett. There's another, another title I carry, though, that people sometimes call me, and sometimes people just say, hey, pastor. Now, I want you to know that I don't take that title lightly. I believe it's a great calling, and I am honored when people address me in that way. There are some people, though, that address me, they just say, hey, Big Nook. Now, I know if people call me Big Nook that they knew me and we were friends in middle school. And I know this because in seventh grade, I hit this massive growth spurt, so at 13 years old, I was the size that I am now, a little over 6'2", 200 pounds in seventh grade. So I got the nickname Big Nook. A little bit later in high school, the big got dropped off and it was just Nook. So if someone calls me Nook, even today, I know that we were teammates back in high school. That's what the people on my basketball team, on the football team, that's what they called me, Nook. But then, of course, most of you probably know me as just Shannon, right? This is a, a term that, uh, that is used if you're a friend, if you're a family. This is the name that you would just probably address me as, Shannon. But there's one name that I actually love being called more than any other name. It's a name that, that I also do not take it for granted. It's the name that only four people on the planet get to call me this. It's my four sons, and they get to call me dad. You see, I bring that up because all these things that come to mind when we picture God, all these ways that we can address him, almighty one, gracious one, holy one, creator, sustainer, there are all these titles that we can give God. There's all these ways that we can picture God, but above everything else, God wants to be pictured as our dad, as our father. Now, I know right now, even when I'm saying this, it's really hard for you to grasp. And it's maybe hard for you under to understand because maybe for you, you didn't have a great dad growing up. Or maybe you didn't have a dad at all. Maybe your dad wasn't even there. He was gone. 
And so when you think about God as a dad, it doesn't really translate that well. Or maybe for you, you did have a dad, but when he was around, he was just checked out emotionally. He was never engaged, so he might as well have been gone. Or maybe there are a few of you in this room that maybe your dad, he wasn't so nice, and maybe he actually uh, was abusive towards you, maybe physically, verbally, emotionally, or whatever, and you wish he was gone. And so some of us, we have a hard time picturing God as our father and God as our dad, but I'm here to tell you this morning that God wants to be known as your father. And he is a good dad. And he's always been good. You know, sometimes I say that and people are like, well, Pastor Shannon, okay, God's our father, he's good, but I don't know if I can believe that he's always been good. I mean, come on, I read the Old Testament and I see all these things and he didn't seem to be very nice and he doesn't seem to be very good, but I'm here to tell you today, if we pick up from last week when Bishop Jamie was talking, he was talking about how we can't just read the old and then the new, we got to read the new into the old. And we got to see how God has progressively have been, has been revealing himself throughout the Bible and throughout history. He wants to be known as a good father, and he wants to be known that he's always been that way. See, I want to show you a verse this morning, and, and this is where Shadows comes into play, right? We're in week four of Shadows. This series is all about, been, uh, we've been taking just different uh, scriptures where the word shadow is used, but we've been uh, really just taking the, the word shadow, but really conveying how good God is in contrast to the shadow. And where I want to take you this morning is James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 17. It's just one quick verse, but there is so much in this verse that I want to unpack this morning. This is what James, the brother of Jesus, right? And he has a lot of stories, I'm sure, to tell. But this is what he actually writes down in his book. He says this in verse 17. Check this out. He says, every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the what? Father coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Who does not change like shifting shadows. Let, let's just think about this just for a minute. When do shadows shift? When do shadows change? You know, I, I opened up the series talking about how Whenever uh, I took my family on vacation this year, we went down to the beach. There was this dude who set up this like 10 by 10 tent right next to me, but the sun was so low in the sky that his tent was casting a shadow on me, and I was there to get some sun. So I had to move my chair, and as I moved my chair and got out of the way, he took all of his stuff, his chairs, his toys, the wagon, all this stuff, and he moved it into the shadow. Well, as the day went on, every 30 minutes, he was moving a couple feet and all of his stuff with him. And he would move a couple feet and all of his stuff with him. So much so that actually my youngest son, or my third son, Titus, he goes, Dad, why is that dude, why is he moving all the time? And I said, he's trying to stay in the shade because the sun is moving. And then, of course, my, my second son, Malachi, he, he's got a little mouth on him. Sometimes he can be a smart aleck. He goes, Dad, the sun isn't moving, the earth is moving. And, of course, I get a fourth-grade geography lesson, but at the same time, my mind is like, the sun isn't moving, the earth is moving. You see, God, in his nature and his character, it has never changed. Our perspective sometimes, our world begins to shift, and our world, because of circumstances and things that we go through, it begins to change, and then a shadow is then cast maybe differently. But God is good, and he always has been good. And I know this because if you were to think right now, who is someone that is good, you probably think about Jesus. Can we all agree that when we picture Jesus, we picture someone as good and faithful and loving and forgiving and merciful? Would you all agree with that? Well, here's the deal. There's three different places in Scripture, probably more, that say that Jesus is who God has always been. Matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 3, it says this, that Jesus is the exact representation, and that is a direct quote. Jesus is the exact representation of who the Father is. Colossians 1 says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So if you want to know what that invisible God is like, the God that maybe you think you can't see, can't get to know, can't understand, all you have to do is look at Jesus 
Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And then Jesus himself, in John chapter 14, verse 8, and this is so cool, Jesus is hanging out with his disciples. And then Philip, now we don't hear a lot about Philip, but Philip actually makes this statement to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, show us the Father, and then we'll be content. Man, I just want to know what the Father is like. And you know what Jesus says to him, man, Jesus, I love how Jesus responds sometimes. He says, Philip, how long have you been with me? Haven't you been with me for a while? Obviously, the answer is yes, for maybe several years. And he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Everything that I say, I've heard the Father say. Everything that I do, I've seen the Father do. And then he asks a question back, and I love this. He says, how can you say, show me the Father? In other words, like, what are you talking about? How can you say, show me the Father? Like, I'm right here. I'm showing you him right now. Jesus is who God has always been. So if we want to know what God is like, all we have to do is look at Jesus. So God is good, and he always has been good. But maybe you're here today, like I said, and you can't necessarily picture God as a good father. But don't worry, because that's what the Holy Spirit is there to help us do. Matter of fact, two different places that Paul writes in Scripture to other churches, he says this in Romans chapter 8, verse 15. If we get that pulled up, he says this. He says, the spirit you receive, the Holy Spirit, does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption, right? You're not slaves, you're sons. And he says, by him we cry out, Abba. Father, this word Abba, I know you probably know this, it's this Aramaic term, and it's the word for daddy. It's the word for papa. You see, the Spirit helps us in recognizing God as a father. So if you maybe can't see him that way, maybe you need to open yourself up just a little bit and allow the Spirit to just speak to you and guide you into that truth. Paul also says to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, he says a very similar thing. He says, because you are his sons. His children, right? Daughters are included in that. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. Man, we have an incredible dad. He is good, and he always has been good. Do you believe that? And here's what we're going to do in the rest of our time together. We're actually going to... Um, to look at a very familiar story for a lot of you. It's a story you've probably heard over and over again in your life. Matter of fact, I've probably heard this story a hundred times. I've preached through this story four or five times, but I kept coming back to it this week because I could go to different places all throughout Scripture to talk about some of the attributes that our God has because if he doesn't change and he had these attributes, it means that he still has these attributes. And I could have went to a lot of places, but I chose to just come to this one story. Because I want to be concise. I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to really grasp what this story is trying to convey. And it's a story, actually, many of us know it as the story of the prodigal son. But really, this story is a picture of a great heavenly father. That's what the title of this story should be, our great heavenly dad. And what we're going to do is we're going to break this down. We've only got 14 verses to go through. And then I'm going to show you very quickly five amazing attributes that our dad has, and we're going to go out of this place encouraged. Does that sound all right? All right, Luke chapter 15, verse 11. If you brought your Bible, you can go ahead and get it out and turn with me there. Luke 15, starting in verse 11. And this is what actually Jesus says. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, forgive me, or father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed Pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, 
He said, how many of my father's hired servants have good food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and I'll go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up. He went to his father. But when he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. This son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Man, the unconditional love of an incredible father. Man, there are five things I want you to get out of this story, five attributes that I see that this father had, that our heavenly father also has. And if you're taking notes, I encourage you to write these down, get out a pen, get out a piece of paper, get out your phone, whatever you got to do to write this down. Because I'm telling you right now, there's going to come a time in your life, maybe even this week, that you're going to be discouraged. You're going to think that God is not good, that he's not like a heavenly father towards you, and you need to get this stuff out, and you need to reread it, and you need to go over it until you actually got it. First thing that we see in this story is this. Our God is a patient father. Our God is a patient father. You see, the son went off to a distant country. And, you know, the the dad did not know what was happening with his son. He gave him his part of the inheritance. Who knows? This son could have invested it wisely. Could he not? He could have made some incredible deals. He could have invested it into some business. He could have been doing very well for himself. He didn't, the the father really didn't know in this story that his son was getting to get to a place where he couldn't even eat what the pigs were eating. But every single day, without fail, I can just picture this father looking to the edge of the field, looking to the mountains, looking to the path. The same path that the son would have left from, he's staring down that path and saying, man, is today going to be the day that my son comes home? Oh, not today. Maybe tomorrow is going to be the day that my son comes home. Well, it didn't happen tomorrow. Well, maybe the next day is going to be the day that my son comes home. You see, it says that when the son came back, it said he was still far off, meaning the dad was in constant He he positioned himself and postured himself to be in constant lookout for his son. You see, he was a patient father. Notice what the father didn't do in this story. And if you're a dad, maybe you can relate with this. Because sometimes with my boys, like I want them to act a certain way. I want them to do a certain thing. And so sometimes I'm thinking, man, can I just come in and control you and get you to do exactly what I want you to do? But the father didn't go all the way and grab his son and say, no, this is what you have to do. This is what you have to spend your money on. This is how you have to live. He didn't do any of that. He just waited patiently. You see, my boys, my sons, man, I got to remember sometimes that they are their own person, if that makes sense, right? They are humans with their own will. I got to make sure that I steward my time as a parent with them well. But I can't come in and be like a puppet master and control them. That isn't our God. That isn't our Father. He doesn't want to control you. He allows you to make the decision that you make. But at the same time, even if those decisions cause you to go down a a spiraling path, God is still waiting patiently there for you. The second thing we learn from the story very quickly is this, that our God is an intimate Father. You see, when he saw the sun far off, what did he do? He took off running. You see, what you have to understand and what you have to wrap your head around, you got to get in this story in the first century when Jesus was telling it to a bunch of Jewish people, and men did not run in that culture. Right, men, they would have probably wore some robes. They had a little slit up the side so that they could move and work, but no self-respecting man would pull up his robe and run. Why? Because his legs would have been exposed, and that was a no-no. That was shameful, but this father did not care. He says, man, my boy is back. And he ran and did what? He threw his arms around him. 
he embraced him. Man, our God, he, he is an intimate father. He wants to have a relationship with his children. God wants to have a relationship with you. He wants you to be like a child that calls out to their father. Do you have that kind of relationship? Would you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you and to guide you into that very thing? The third thing that we see from the story is this, is that our God is a forgiving father. And have you ever thought about this, what the son actually asked his dad for in asking for the inheritance? When do you get an inheritance? After somebody dies. Like it's my hope to be in a position where I can leave my boys an inheritance after I'm gone. So in other words, this son comes up to his dad and said, hey, dad, can I have my part of the inheritance? He's basically saying, dad, you're dead to me. I don't want anything else to do with you or the family anymore. And you also notice whenever he got to the place where he was trying to eat what the pigs were eating, it said he came to his senses. And then what did he do? He started to write out a script. He said, man, I need to go back and, and I need to tell my father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Would you make me like one of your hired servants? And I can only imagine, you know, it probably took days to travel from wherever he was at to get back home. So for days, he was just walking on that trail, probably repeating that script over and over and over again. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please make me like one of your hired servants. Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called a son. Would you make me like one of your hired servants? Over and over and over and over again, he probably rehearsed this. And you notice in the story what happens. He gets in front of his dad. His dad's run. He embraces him. And he starts off with the script. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Would you make me like one of your hired servants? What does the dad do in this picture, in this story? He doesn't pay any attention to it. He didn't say, oh, son, you're forgiven. Oh, son, I know, I understand. Yes, you can come in. He didn't even pay attention. The son was probably still talking. He turns to his servant and said, hey, go get the calf. Get a robe, get a ring, get sandals, like get all this stuff. He doesn't pay any attention. Why? Because his son was already forgiven. Can I tell you right now, regardless of where you're at, regardless of what you've done, regardless of the mistakes that you've made, that you are already forgiven in Christ? Oh, come on. Somebody doesn't get that revelation yet. You are already forgiven. Christ died 2,000 years ago. He took upon the sin of the world upon himself. And so when you mess up, when you sin, after you come to Christ, your past, present, and future sins, right, they are forgiven. They are already forgiven. Matter of fact, when you meet somebody on the street, whether or not they have come to Christ yet or not, you need to awaken their eyes to, uh, to the fact that their sins have already been forgiven in Christ. They just don't know it yet. You see, here's the thing what we have to understand, and, and, and follow me when I'm saying this because I don't want you to judge me right away. Let, let me finish this thought. Do you know that there is something that God can't do? Now, that sounds like a bold statement, right, because God is omnipotent, he's all-powerful, he's omniscient, he knows all, like he is everywhere, like God can do anything, but I'm here to tell you right now, there's something that God can't do. Matter of fact, God, in the scripture, it says that when we come to Christ, he actually removes our sins from us, they are cast as far as the east is from the west, and the book of Isaiah says that God remembers our sins no more. So there is something that God can't do. God can't remember your sin. Why? Because it's been covered by the blood of Jesus. And that is good news, church. Super good. And we have a God, we have a dad who is so forgiving. Fourth thing, real quick. Our God is a giving father. Our God is a giving father. You know, we looked in James and we talked about how every good and perfect gift comes from above. So everything that is good in your life, you can attribute that to God. And some of you might be like, well, I worked for all this. I did all this on my own. Well, who gave you life? Who gave you breath? Who gave you those abilities? Who gave you those talents? Who gave you those desires? Man, every good and perfect gift comes from above. And that means that if there's things in your life that aren't good, I'm telling you right now that those did not come from God. That God is not the author of all. Right? Last week, Jamie talked about this briefly when he mentioned that God is not in control. 
I like to say it like this, God is not the author of all. God is not the author of death. He's not the author of sickness and cancer. He's not the author of when a little girl, you know, gets abused. He's not the author of all that stuff. We have to deal with that stuff because we live in a, wor- a world that's tainted by sin. But that does not come from God. Our God only knows how to give good gifts. Matter of fact, Matthew chapter 7 says this. He says, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more does our Heavenly Father know how to give good gifts to us? You see, Mel and I, we pride ourselves on getting our kids incredible gifts, don't we? Like I know she's over smiling right now. She won't let you in on this, but man, this girl goes out of her way. Man, she will sacrifice. She will give up everything, and she'll spend a ton amount of time. She breaks out the catalogs. She gets with them, you know, for Christmas months in advance. She's already, she's already been getting with them on what they want for Christmas and showing them stuff. Like she loves, and I love to get my boys good things. We love their eyes to light up when they open up that gift. And if we know how to give good gifts to our kids, Scripture says how much more. Does God know how to give incredible gifts? In this story, right, this this father runs and embraces his son, and he says, man, break out the robe. He covers him in a robe, right? He was probably stinky. He stank of some pigs. He smelly. He was in dirty clothes. But the father threw his own robe around him, signifying, man, I, I don't care what you look like. You might be dirty. You might be stanky. But, man, you're clean and you're beautiful in my eyes. We have the same thing with Jesus. We are clothed with Christ. He gives us the ring. He gave the ring, right, to symbolize that you are still part of the family. He says, hey, I can tell that you're tired and worn out from the journey. I got shoes to put on your feet. Hey, go kill the fattened calf. Man, it was a party. It was a celebration, and there were gifts that were given. I'm telling you right now, our dad loves to give us good gifts. And then the last thing, real quick, and I'm going get, to get the band to come up, and they're going to they're gonna help me as I close out. And we're going to go out of this place rejoicing and being thankful for the God that we have. But number five, if you're taking notes, is this. And this is kind of overarching the entire day, is our God is a loving Father. Our God is a loving Father. He is good, He is loving, and He's always been loving. In Him, there is no shifting shadow. It's not some days when things are bad, oh, He loves me not. It's not some days when things are on good, oh, today He loves me. Oh, He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. It is simply He loves me at all times. Our God is a loving Father. You see, because God is a loving Father, He was patient. Because God is a loving father, he was intimate with his son. Because this father was a loving father, he actually embraced him and he forgave him. Before he even showed up, he was already forgiven. Because he was loving, he loved to continue to give good gifts. You know, I, got, I got one last story and then we're going to pray and then, and then we're going to rejoice. And, and if people need prayer in here, we're going to give you prayer. You know, growing up, I always thought I had to perform to please my dad. I did. You know, that's why I worked so hard in school. I worked my butt off to try to get straight A's. Had a few D's thrown in there, but man, I worked my butt off. You know, that's why I always tried out for every sports team, and then I worked my butt off on the athletic field or on the court, and I, I would always be like, Dad, you see how many points I scored? Man, Dad, did you see that dunk? But I always thought I had to perform for my dad. On the job site, man, dad, I'm right there with you. What do you need? Carrying lumber, carrying shingles up to the roof. Dad, I'm doing all this stuff. I mean, even at like 10, 11, 12 years old. Because I thought my position as a son and who my dad was proud of was based on performance. You know, for the longest time, I even thought that, you know, man, I got to perform before people. I got to have people approve of me, and I care about what people think of me, but I'm telling you right now, there came a point in my life where all that began to shift, all that began to change. And those of you that are parents, you can really relate with this. You see, once I started to have kids, and I, and I have my sons now, my four sons, I'm going to tell you right now, there is nothing that they will ever do that will stop my love for them. They can mess up. They can get into trouble. Man, they can get into stuff that maybe maybe is really harmful and stuff that kind of breaks my heart. But nothing will change the fact 
that I love them. It's not based on how well they do. It's not based on how many goals my son Isaac scores in soccer. It isn't based on the grades that they bring home. I love them. Why? Because they are my children. Man, I'm trying to make this as simple as I can for you, that God loves you. He wants you to look at him whenever you think about God, what picture comes to mind. He hopes it has a loving father. But that's how you picture it. As a dad who, who would do anything for his kids. Man, God is patient. Our Father is patient. Maybe the day is the day for you to come home. Maybe you've been running from God and, and you don't know if you can come back. I'm telling you, He's there with His arms wide open. He's been on the lookout for you since the day you started running. Maybe today is the day that you just receive an embrace from the Father, that you need to receive like this love and this intimacy. You need to know that you're cared for. Matter of fact, in just a little bit as the band is going to be playing, we're going to be up front. And if you just need to come up and just get a hug, man, I just really believe that that love and grace and, and just Jesus is released sometimes just through a hug. So we're going to make that available for you today. Man, you need to know today that you're forgiven. That 2,000 years ago, Jesus went to the cross and he bled and he died for the forgiveness of your sin. And that sacrifice was good once for all, for all time. You just have to awaken to the reality that you're already forgiven. That you already have everything you need in Jesus Christ. Maybe that's the day that you need today to just be told that, man, you're a son, you're a daughter, and you are forgiven. Yes, you've made a mistake. Yes, there's been some stuff in your past, but all that stuff is under the blood of Jesus. And then lastly, man, maybe, maybe some of you just have been going through a season and, and you don't feel like God's been giving you very many gifts, but you feel that way because you've been comparing yourself with other people and you're only comparing your material possessions. Can we just get over that? Can we stop that and realize that sometimes when we're in a painful season, man, sometimes that God just gifts us with comfort. And that is incredible. Sometimes when we're sick, you know what God gifts us with? Healing. Sometimes when things are chaotic and maybe we're depressed, maybe we're anxious, you know what God gifts us with? His peace. Maybe that's, maybe that's you today. You just need to experience some peace, some love, some joy, some forgiveness. And if that's you, man, I, I want you to receive that today.